So hello everybody. I'm really honored to be here today. So I really tried to come to this event last year. Unfortunately, due to some scheduling conflict, it wasn't possible. So I'm really happy to be here today. So my name is Dirk. I work for Dynatrace, as um, was already told. My role at Dynatrace is cloud technology lead, which sounds fancy, and it is. So I get to play around with all si core signs of um, um, cloud and container technologies and try to figure out what is the best way to monitor those technologies, really get to know them and find out how it works. And OpenStack is, was one of my key research topics for the last one and a half years. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to share with you what I've learned and what I think is, is necessary to do useful OpenStack monitoring. So you probably all know this infographic. It's from the OpenStack user survey, where they like ask around what are the reasons that people are actually using OpenStack. And for me, two line items actually put it really to the point. And those combined actually got the highest values together. So it's on the one hand, the ability to be, uh, to be able to innovate faster and to uh, increase the operational efficiency. Why those two things? So the innovative part about OpenStack definitely is not that you're able to like, start new VMs through the command line. So the, the VM part and the, the virtualization part is not the innovation here. I think the, the innovative part here is that it actually allows you to deploy, develop, and, and just run and scale cloud-native applications that are distributed over several virtual machines, maybe different data centers. And OpenStack enables you to be able to like, play around with those technologies, make it fast, so in the previous um, before virtualization, you actually had to like order five new servers if you want to try out something new. Now it's pretty easy to do that, right? And there are containers that actually make it even easier. There's Kubernetes on the bottom of OpenStack with Cola, on top of OpenStack with Magnum, for example, that actually really drives cloud-native technologies on OpenStack. As for operational efficiency, it allows you to actually deploy your application faster. So has any one of you ever worked with Cloud Foundry in here? Or has heard of it? OK, so it's like the PaaS platform from Pivotal. And it, it comes with a deployment um, um, script. It's a Bosch script that actually allows you to pretty easily roll out this Cloud Foundry component. And since nobody knows it, if you set up Cloud Foundry, it usually takes up 24 VMs and there is no application running. So it's really cool that you can actually roll it out by a click of a button. And actually, companies out there using OpenStack to build applications on top to provide end user value. So there's PayPal. Every transaction you're doing with PayPal runs over OpenStack. There is CERN, we heard of in the keynote before. They're calculating black holes and whatnot with the help of OpenStack. And there is, for example, also the... So I was three weeks ago in Canada on a meetup roadshow, and one meetup was at the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. And it was pretty cool. So those guys are actually running a distributed OpenStack cluster all around the world to actually help researchers around the world to provide computing power for cancer research. It's awesome. So with, with OpenStack on the bottom and like applications on top, it's all been about... And I think Mark Collet for the OpenStack Foundation cited that over and over again. Cloud is all about application. Let's see what the new LAMPstack 2.0 is. And I have like three different examples what this could be. So on the one hand, it could be OpenStack at the infrastructure as a service level, Cloud Foundry on the platform as a service level. Next version is OpenShift. Don't know if you've heard of it. Also awesome. And OpenShift basically is Kubernetes on steroids provided by Red Hat. So there are companies behind that that actually use this to drive innovation and build modern applications. So for Cloud Foundry, it's Volkswagen and SAP. Don't know why so many German companies actually use that. For OpenStacks, it's BMW and Amadeus, so that the airplane ticket processing company. And for example, Comcast and eBay build on the stack with OpenStack and Kubernetes. So there is large adoption out there for those three stacks. And come to think of it, all of the vendors of OpenStack distributions, which are 
not coincidentally now also those who have Linux distributions also provide a pass layer on top. So they also found that cloud is all about applications and they're addressing this topic. So SUSE has recently announced at SUSECon in Prague three weeks ago that they will have a Cloud Foundry version. You have guessed that the middle one, it's Red Hat that actually drives this and canonically has also its own Kubernetes application. So why are we talking about that? So what is the difference between running applications in public clouds and on OpenStack? So if you run your applications on AWS, for example, you, you really only see the tip of the iceberg, that is your application. You don't really know what's below that on the hardware level. Then again, you don't care. Why should you? You pay that the things just work. On the OpenStack side, on the other hand, you exactly know how the cloud platform works, because on the one hand you set it up, <laughs> on the other hand you need to operate it. Which is good, because you know that there are like six core services and 60 plus additional services you can use to provide services um, to your end users, and like some supporting services on the side. But on the other hand, you also need to fix things if they break, you need to make sure that your OpenStack cluster runs and that actually those applications on top can also be running. So I want to give you an overview of the monitoring tool landscape, which is not complete at all because new tools seem to be popping out every week. And I'm going to, I have grouped them a little bit. So let's start with the first group. So it's like the Nagio Sensus Isinger part, which does system user system resource um, um, monitoring, right? You can monitor if a host is up or down, if a service is up and running, say if Keystone is up and running, for example. You can check for storage problems. You can even um, query your active network components to gather some statistics. This is one group. Then the other group is like the more log-focused um, um, tool chains. So Elastic, previously known as the Elk stack. Um, so Logstash, Kibana, and, and Elasticsearch. And Sumo Logic and FluentD, for example, for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Those projects actually aim on gathering log files, analyzing log files, identifying patterns in those log files, and like chart you a graph of if there have, have been a lot of errors or not. Then we have an, a, another group that's kind of like in the middle. So there's this OpenStack project called Monaska, which basically does what both of the other things are doing. So it, on the one hand, provides you with log monitoring. On the other hand, it provides you with system resource utilization monitoring. And since, so who knows Elastic here? I mean, it should be known. OK. Who knows Beats from Elastic? Also a few people. Awesome. So since Beats, this is like a, a, a lightweight data ship or alternative to Logstash. And it allows you not only to push log files, to Elasticsearch, but also metrics, system metrics, so like Nagios does. And you can also chart it with Elastic, uh, with, with Kibana in the end. So it's a pretty neat alternative, actually. And then there is also a company that I work for. And now I will briefly introduce you what we're doing. So Dynatrace comes originally from application performance and monitoring. We've been doing that for 15 years now. And we actually... Um, um, can monitor applications from end user level through application level down to cloud platform level. And over the last years, we've extended our monitoring support also to container and cloud technologies to provide you the full view again. And yeah, since we actually have 15 years experience in that and that area is already, it was pretty easy for us to actually just include those new data sources and include it in our correlation engine and stuff like that. Well, all of these tools have in common is that they all work the same way. There is always some kind of an agent component that resides on the host capturing data. This component usually sends the data to a central server component that then does somehow some magic computations. And at the end, you get a visual representation of that. So just to make it clear, all of those tools up that are up here work the same way. So let's take a look at the haystack that I was mentioning earlier. So wh what is the, the stack that you actually have to monitor, maintain, and observe look like? So of course, you can have OpenStack at the bottom. 
OpenStack consists of several services, writes more than 100 log files if you have an AJ setup, consists of several processes that run that services, so there are like a lot of, 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 of points where things can go wrong. If it were only for OpenStack, I, th I think we should be good. But usually you don't have OpenStack just for fun. Usually you have OpenStack to run something on top. And that could either be one of those platforms, so we actually cover them th of th uh, many of those already. Another alternative would be uh, Mesos and Marathon. I think at, at CERN they are using that actually. And usually on top of those platforms, you also have your applications. So you have Java applications, Cloud Native actually allows you to use the language of your choice. So you have a polyglot environment in there. And if you look at the stack, it's basically easy to say it's just a question of when it's going to fail, not a question of if something's going to fail. So it has been failing with traditional hardware. It has been failing with traditional enterprise applications. Of course, it will fail here again, because in the end, it's humans that develop these programs, and it's just a question of time. And let's say you, you want to observe all of these things. So, so what are the things you would actually need to look at? I've been at several um, OpenStack mid-cycle operators meetup. It's really difficult to say. And all of the questions, or some of the questions in the login and monitoring um, um, part always was, what should I monitor? What should I monitor when I monitor OpenStack? And here is my take on that. Oh, yeah, it could be a hybrid scenario as well, where you have some workloads in a different public cloud. What should you monitor? You definitely need to take care of the OpenStack services. Are they up and running? Are they consuming too much resources? Are they responding in time, or is the performance of Keystone degrading? These are things you need to be aware of. The same goes for the supporting services. Is your MySQL database performing properly? Is your RabbitMQ running out of file descriptors for whatever reason and can pick up new connections, can set out messages? Are there any unacknowledged message in messages in your queues? Then it's about resource utilization and you, you just need to be aware of how many resources have you left in your OpenStack cluster. Is there like a rogue VM that's, that uses up all of the CPU that influences other, C, uh, other VMs? Same for storage, memory, and network, of course. You need to do log analysis. So we saw a bunch of tools uh, that kept that handle log files. And OpenStack is heavily re relying on log files for, um, um, let's say, troubleshooting. So usually if something fails on OpenStack, what do you do? You just read the log file. If you can find the right log file, on the right host at the right point in time before log rotation sets in. So it, it can be a cumbersome task. Then, of course, you also need to take care of the applications because at the end of the day, those applications are actually the reason why you had OpenStack in the first place. And if you have like applications running that generate revenue in some kind and provide, provide value to some other end users in, in some kind, Someone is going to knock on your door and say, why is this application so slow? And you will most likely need to be able to get an answer to that. Then we had the PaaS platforms that are all over the place right now. And yeah, we already had that. You need to also monitor what are the users out there. Are your users satisfied with the performance that you're actually um, um, providing with the platform that you built for them? So if you collect all of this data, it's like a lot. Right? You have a lot of, of data points, a lot of metrics, a lot of log files, and usually you have those in, in distributed places, in data silos. You have your log files in Elastic, you have your system uh, metrics in Nagios, and how are you going to make sense out of all of that? So the key to making sense out of that is actually to correlate it, right? So correlation is a statistical measure that kind of like measures how much two variables fluctuate together, which totally sounds fancy. And it just means that if, if two things happen at the same time, they're correlating. But it does not necessarily mean that there is a causation behind it, that there is a causal relationship between those two things. And I usually give a, a, a senseless example of what correlation actually could look like. And I hope you're not offended by that. So. The number of people who drowned in pools actually correlates to the numbers of movies where um, Nicolas Cage appears in. 
It correlates. It's just there. Now, one could argue if there is a causation behind that. So, are people drowning because Nick Cage makes so many movies? Or is Nick Cage driving on the fact that people are drowning in pools and making him making more movies? But the point I'm making is just because two things happen at the same time, and you seem to be able to notice them at the same time, doesn't mean that they have anything to do with each other. Let me give you a more software engineering-like example. Let's say you have a service that's called B, and for some reason you know that the response time of this service increases by two seconds. It just does, and you know it. Then there is like a, a host where the CPU utilization spikes up by 90%. Those two things happen at the same time. They correlate. So it would be a no-brainer to say, of course, the service is slow because the CPU utilization is high. Then again, it could be different than that because you don't know on which host this service actually runs, right? So it could be a totally different service running on a totally different host. Those two things could have nothing in, in common with each other. So what I'm actually saying is you need to be aware of the application dependencies and like the architecture of your environment. So you need context. You can't just pick out any single metric and try to figure out or, or try to infer something into that. It's like reading tea leaves. You need to have the context and you need to have all the data that you actually need to be able to do that. Otherwise, you maybe end up like this guy. So he is fixing a flat tire because this is the part where he focuses on. This is the part where he has monitoring in place. This is the part that he observes. What he might miss out on is actually that that's not the point. So if you don't see the whole picture, you might be actually fixing a, a flat tire while there's something going on over here. And this translated to OpenStack and application means if you only fix your op OpenStack, you might miss out on what's going on on application and user experience side. And to underline that, I would like to give you an example that is easy to understand and that is um, um, that really makes the point. So this is a visual representation of an application that we actually have. So on the top, you see two user-facing applications. So it's like a business-to-business -business portal for a travel agency, and it's like the user-facing uh, front-end of a, of a travel agency. And you see there are some Tomcat services inside, there is a MongoDB, and the lines just show how the individual components of your software work with each other. And out of, out of the bottom of it, you actually see that all of those services run on virtual machines on an OpenStack compute node. So far, so good. Now, we once had an intern, his name was Danny, and Danny got the task to actually fix a bug in this service over here, in the payment service. So he fixed the bug, committed the, the change, the change got deployed, and what happened? All of a sudden, the response time of this service just increased. It spiked for no obvious reason. And now we're, we're again in the scenario where, we, where we're assuming that we monitor all of that. And that was okay. So, okay, the service, the, the bug was... There, there is a bug in the bug fix, apparently, and it just needs to rework it again. A few minutes later, something very, very peculiar happened. The application over here got slower for the users. So this was the user-facing web application, so the checkout process for your journeys was actually slower than it used to be. Users got frustrated. They called. What's up? It's so slow. What happened? And uh, the funny thing is that the application was slow because the services it, it depends on was slow. And this actually went down to the very last service. So all of these services were all of a sudden slow, resulting in an affecting the end user application. And after looking at this uh, a little bit more, we actually found out that the bug fix had spiked the CPU of this virtual machine to 100%, which in turn had the effect that also the compute node was affected. So also this CPU utilization spiked, which had the effect that also the CPU utilization of this VM spiked, 
So in the end, Danny was able to screw up this application over here by committing a uh, yeah, not very awesome bug fix over there. Now, this is very key, actually. So in order to be able to figure that out, you need to monitor all of those, all of those things. You need to be able to correlate all of those things. And if you have to do it manually, then it would probably take you a little while. But I think at this size, it actually would work. So adding on top of the things we actually had is, we need to be able to correlate metrics, events, and data, all, of all that we're gathering. And you need to know the architecture and the dependencies of the application components you have. And as I was just saying, it works manually, yes. Then again, this is not a regular-sized application environment. You don't have OpenStack for an application that has five VMs, two services, and a few end-user-facing applications. We at Dynatrace actually see application environments that look more like that. So there are like 142 hosts, 10,000 processes, 3,000 services, nine end-user-facing applications. And all of those could be actually containerized. So doing manual root cause analysis in that application, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I don't want to do it, because you will grow gray before you actually find the root cause of anything. So you need something that is actually easy to deploy, scalable, and is able to handle an environment of that size. So I really like to talk to the CERN guy afterwards and ask him how big his Elasticsearch cluster actually is. And yeah, I think I made my point that this is challenging. And it can be challenging to monitor your whole environment based on OpenStack. And yeah, now it's basically up to you how you're going to face this challenge. Are you going into a war room equipped with like Nagios and a few checks? Or are you going into the war room with the whole fleet, 20 submarines in there, and attacking the problem front on with a, a top to bottom monitoring approach? It's basically up to you. The point is, if you don't monitor at all, you never really know what you get. Thanks. Are there any questions? Yes. Dynatrace virtually has no limits. <laughs> so for a container, we, you don't need to modify the code of the application or the, the container image at all. We are able to automatically inject into the container and monitor all of the processes. All you need to do is install the agent on the operating system level, and you're done. As for virtual machines, you need to install the one agent in the virtual machine to be able to get insights of the applications that run inside. And how do you do that on Kubernetes? Um, because if you... Yeah. On Kubernetes, we actually work with the daemon set that just like, so you define the daemon set on the Kubernetes master, and then it gets rolled out on all Kubernetes nodes out of the box. Yeah. And in future, so Cloud Foundry announced that they're also going to use Kubernetes now. There's going to be a different approach. So when you roll out your Kubernetes cluster using Bosch, you have the possibility to immediately install the one agent with Bosch, and you don't need to modify your Kubernetes installation then anymore. Mm -hmm. Any more uh, questions? So I have a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you've been, you said that you've been doing that uh, long before the cloud, and then it was easy for you to move in. So I was just wondering, is there any special challenges or differences in the cloud that you can tell us about that is make it more challenging, like monitoring the cloud than monitoring a typical, or they are similar? What, what can you say about this? So uh, I think the challenge of the cloud is actually that the applications you deal there are, are dynamic. So they're scaling up in the morning because all of the users log in and use the service, scale down over noon because nobody's using it, and have to scale back up again. And I think this dynamics okay. is actually what kind yeah. of like makes 
the monitoring approach very interesting. Okay. And yeah, you just need to be able. So you have to have a tool that actually can work with this dynamics and yeah. and yeah. Okay. Deal with it. Okay. So we have a <laughs> present for you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.